Hey everyone, and welcome to the first episode of The History Of in 2019. Well, sort of. This is take two for our first video, as we sort of missed a few points on the first go around. Anyway, hope everyone's holidays were enjoyable. As a late gift, we'd figure we'd start off the year with a video that's been requested a few times in the comments. Today, we'll be going over Canada's digital camouflage pattern, the one pattern that essentially jump-started the whole digital camouflage movement. Without further delay, let's dive right in and go over the Canadian disruptive pattern, or as it's more commonly referred to as, CAD pattern. Whoa, what's the US doing? Updating their uniforms, gear, and equipment, as well as creating a standardized camouflage? Look, Germany's doing the same thing too. So is France, and even Spain. It seems like almost all of NATO is following this trend. Maybe we should look into updating our equipment. That was the mentality of Canada in the late 1980s through the mid-1990s. And so Canada began talks in 1988 to create a sort of soldier system that would experiment, design, and ultimately lead to new and updated uniforms, gear, and equipment. The first attempt at this began in 1995 with the Integrated Protective Clothing and Equipment Technology Demonstrator, or IPCETD for short. Apart from the occasional reversible Mitchell helmet cover and M81 woodland pattern seen on a few bits of equipment, Canada had only issued three camouflage patterns on a large scale since World War II. British Brushstroke, Canadian DPM, both of which were only used by airborne forces, and a woodland camouflage known as the Canadian Garrison Dressed Land Forces Jacket, which was issued to troops to be worn only with garrison dress. Why issue a camouflage to be worn only as part of a garrison uniform? A good question for another time. All other forces continued to wear and utilize solid colored OG-107 uniforms, not to be confused with the US OG-107s. IPCETD seemed good on paper, but because the design process was overly expensive, rushed, and proper goals and guidelines weren't well thought out, it ultimately failed. However, from the ashes of IPCE came the Clothe the Soldier, or CTS, in 1996. This new project laid out proper groundwork and set a specific goal of realizing and correcting deficiencies in obsolete aspects of uniforms and gear so that Canadian forces would be ready for both combat and non-combat operations on a global scale. This project broke the process down into the following steps. What items needed repair and or updating? If a particular item did, is there a possible solution that is available through MOTS, which is short for military off the shelf, meaning an already created item available through military supply, or COTS, short for commercial off the shelf, meaning readily available to the public which can be purchased and utilized by the military. Once a decision was made as far as MOTS and COTS, evaluations began to see how well the items worked and if a solution was found. From there, the potential solution, meaning new item be it gear, uniform, or piece of equipment, was tested by a large variety and number of forces. Then, a final user acceptance trial was held, where the solution must reach at least an 80% overall pass score by participants. Lastly, the pass solution was then handed over and procured for future issue. So, during the Clothe the System trials, a large number of items were tested, from new hats and helmets to winter gear and boots. However, the most influential and perhaps most important one was that of CAD pattern, or Canadian Disruptive Pattern. But just how did the Canadians end up with a digital pattern? Since the 80s, Canada had been experimenting with adopting a new camouflage, but had really only been testing based on what looked right in specific terrain, as well as what troops testing them thought. This style over science approach was eventually thrown to the wayside with CTS in favor of a more in-depth and accurate study, which began with the Canadian government contracting DADCON, a Danish company, to conduct numerous spectral analyses of woodland terrains throughout Canada and Central and Northern Europe in spring, summer, and autumn seasons. The data, consisting of both infrared and visual spectrums of objects ranging from 50 to 300 meters, was then computer analyzed to determine the most common colors one should use for a woodland pattern. The results? Well, the colors you see in CAD pattern. Black, light brown, light green, and dark green. It was then that the Canadian government took the data and began experimenting with various shapes and sizes to maximize concealment at the same 50 to 300 meter ranges, using the naked eye and magnification devices, as well as passive and active night vision goggles. After various tests and calculations, the digital effect was created. The reason? Well, put simply, it's easier to design with rectangles on a computer. 
Without getting too sciencey, a more specific reason is that digital camouflage patterns often go the route of the disruptive coloration or patterning in regards to the color. This form of camouflage utilizes the concept of contrasting colors to help break up hard edges and outlines. The idea is that these colors don't necessarily relate to one another, with the exception that they will blend into various similar environments. As far as actual design goes, many digital patterns use the idea of multiscale. This concept takes two or more scales or sizes of patterns and overlap them, resulting in the camouflage being effective close up as well as far away. These ideas don't necessarily have to be utilized in a digital pattern, as the same effect can be seen on Italian vegetato and multicam patterns, to name a few. However, careful consideration must be made in all these areas in order to ensure its effectiveness. If not, you'll end up with UCP. Anyway, back to Cad Pad. It's worth noting that during this time, an arid pattern was also being created, though not as much emphasis was being put into it, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. Once the woodland pattern, now officially named CADPAT TW, or temperate woodland, was finalized, field testing began sometime in 1995. In order to achieve the maximum effect of CADPAT, various strict requirements were set with the printing relating to the fabric textures, dyes, and overlapping of shapes. Because of insufficient technology, initial prints ran into issues where the straight edges of the shapes began to bleed into one another. So, while the proper equipment was being sourced by way of the company Saab Barracuda, the first test uniforms were contracted out. Most pieces went to the same company, Saab Barracuda, while others were rumored to have been made in Pakistan. These pieces faded rather quickly and did not meet the strict requirements at all. Once the tech was upgraded in 1998 to properly print the patterns domestically on a larger scale, roughly 330 soldiers over three 110 light infantry companies throughout Canada began field testing. As far as procurement and issue, it gets a little confusing. The pattern didn't become official standard issue until 1997. However, testing didn't fully conclude until 2001, the year CADPAT was copyrighted by the Canadian government. Between these years, the uniforms underwent some tweaking and style changes, as the first uniforms, also known as Gen 1 uniforms, were just the older style OG-107 and 1982 pattern gear printed in CADPAT. However, the first officially issued CADPAT item distributed to troops was a helmet cover for the recently standardized CG-634 helmet. As a part of Clothe the Soldier, many items such as load-bearing vests, gloves, and boots began being made with CADPAT printed onto them. Not long after, the U.S. Marine Corps unveiled their woodland and desert MARPAT camouflage patterns. There has been long speculation and conflicting stories as to how the Marine Corps ended up with their digital pattern. If you want to see more about that, you can check out our History of MARPAT video. Anyway, once everything was sorted out and finalized, the first instance of CADPAT TW being worn by forces abroad was seen during Operation Palladium in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2001. It then fully replaced the older olive drab uniforms worn by the Army in 2002, with the Air Force following suit in 2004. Things got a bit weird shortly after Canada sent forces to Afghanistan in late 2001, though. Weird in what way? Weird as in wearing a woodland camouflage in desert terrain. That's right, for about a year or so, Canadian troops operating in Afghanistan wore CADPAT TW. Remember that arid version of CADPAT we mentioned earlier? Yeah, well, the military soon realized it was about time to finalize that pattern, and so issue began to members of the second rotation in mid-2002. This arid version, called AR for arid region, underwent an equally arduous testing as well. While woodland CADPAT had remained mostly unchanged during the testing phase, CADPAT AR underwent a few changes in its colors, with the first iteration more closely resembling that of Desert MARPAT. The final version had its pattern become larger than TW and went vertical rather than horizontal. The idea behind this was that troops were more likely to be hidden at further distances, 300 to 600 meters to be exact, as well as in far less dense terrain. A third version of the pattern, called CADPAT WA, or Winter Arctic, was trialed during this time. This pattern has seen limited use by certain forces operating in specific Arctic and winter conditions. On a side note, a fourth pattern for use in urban environments is in the process of being trialed for Canadian CBR, or Chemical Biological Radioactive Units. The requirements for this fourth pattern state that it should be designed to be worn in three major urban areas in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. Dubbed QPAT, or Canadian Urban Environment Pattern, this is still in the testing phase. The first two prototype patterns came in late 2011 and were from Guy Kramer's Hyperstealth. 
The first version being a more traditional digital pattern, while the second is a far more unconventional pattern, incorporating three-dimensional shapes which are reminiscent of halls and doorways. A third variant was then unveiled in 2016. This one had a more dense pattern design and darker color scheme that utilizes more shades of gray and tan. This pattern was created to be used in more suburban areas where concrete and cement turns to more grass and semi-wooded areas. As of right now, January 2019, the Canadian military has produced about 50 trial uniforms of QPAT-1, but no new updates have been announced. If and or when there are any announcements about a new uniform, we'll be sure to cover it here. Since its official issue in 2002, CADPAT uniforms have undergone a number of changes. Each new cut of the uniform is dubbed Generation 1, 2, and so on. We will be diving deeper into those with our supplementary video with the help of mixtape from the YouTube channel War Aesthetics so be sure to check that out in the near future. However, in the meantime, if you like the 1980s, military footage, analog tape format, and or retro wave music, be sure to check out his channel. Well, here we are at the end of another The History Of video. As always, we hope you found it entertaining and or informative. Thanks to everyone who watched or came back to rewatch the updated version. We'd like to take this slight snafu to announce that we've created a Discord server for the channel. We'll be posting a brief video with specifics very shortly. Remember to subscribe or check back in the future for more videos right here on Uniform History.